What was your branch of service? Army Nurse Corps. And your highest rank? Second Lieutenant. And what general locations did you serve in? Well, first of all, I had to go to boot camp in Fort Devens, Mass. And after that, I went to uh, Framingham, Mass, where I took a course in psychiatric nursing. And from there, I enlisted to go overseas. And what made you decide to go into psychiatric nursing over other, other kinds of nursing? Well, uh, they were offering two courses at that time, and one was to be uh, an anesthetist, but that got filled up, so I thought, oh, heck, I'll, <laughs> I'll take the other one. I thought it might come in handy someday. And w was nursing something that you were interested in anyway? No, not really. Oh. I just did it. How did, how did that come about? How did you decide, you know, I'm going to go into the Army and I'm going to become a oh. nurse? Oh, how did I first? Well, um, uh, the war was on while I was in training, and I trained at Cooley Dickinson Hospital in Northampton, Mass., and we graduated, and we were all very patriotic. And so, what the heck? We thought we'd sign up and go. And so, uh, I decided I wasn't going into the Navy because they wore black stockings. And I thought, I'm not taking that branch. I'm going into the Army because I can wear regular stockings because I wore black stockings three years all through my nursing career. And when was um, when was this? When did you enroll? In? Uh, it's in the 40s, but you know, I'm I'm 91 now and I'm not good with dates, so uh, you'll just have to fill in for yourself and figure <laughs> what the, when the war was on. Okay. And um, where were you living at the time that you enlisted? Were you in Westfield, Massachusetts yes. at that time? I was in Westfield, Mass. Did you have friends who joined with you, or did you know anybody else who was... Well, there was one young lady that was in my nursing class, and uh, she originally graduated with me, and she was very patriotic too, but we took physicals and she didn't pass. She had uh, a little problem with her heart, so I had to go alone. And um, what were your first days in the service like? Was it what you expected, or was it... Well, do you remember, do you remember, the, was it, um, do you remember, you know, having to line up and suddenly start taking orders? Um, well, we had to go to boot camp, and I couldn't understand why nurses had to learn to march. <laughs> but we did have to learn to take orders, and of course we had to learn the different ranks of command. Mm -hmm. And was that hard? Yes, it was. Tell, tell us more about that. Well, I can't tell you the truth how they go. But, uh, well, it was very important because if you were walking along, you know, you had to salute other officers. And uh, if you didn't, well, you might be in trouble. Did you ever get in trouble? No, not really. Came close a couple of times. <laughs> How close did you come? If I tell you this, maybe you can cut it out if it's not important. Okay. Well, when we when I was in France, well, uh, our only entertainment was going to the officers' club, and lots of times, some of the GIs who were well enough to go out, we would take an, uh, one of our bars off and put it on them. So they pretended to be an officer, and we took them into the officers' club, and they were scared skinny, but. But we wanted them to have a good time. And then, can you just imagine them going back to the front and saying, I was an officer for one night. So I don't know if that, you know. Um, do you remember any of your instructors back at, um, or at, during your initial training? Do you recall any in particular? Uh, no, I couldn't remember the bad sergeant that taught, taught us to drill. No, I don't. No, I don't think I can remember much. 
Did, okay. any, did anybody stand out to you? No, not really. Yeah. Not really. Our nursing instructors were quite strict. They all came from Mass General, so we really got a very good training. So, But uh, their names slipped my mind right at the moment. But we got a good training. Yeah. Now, were there how many of there were you, or, or were, you know, was it there in were, small groups? There were 18 in our class, of, in, in training, group. that is, to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. But in our, our outfit, oh gosh, I think we were well over 100 nurses. Mm -hmm. And did, were you able to, um, did you get to know people, uh, you know, some of your, your fellow uh, enlistees, as, as, did you get to become friends? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because when we first, uh, I don't know if you want me to go way back. To, yeah. Well, well first, to, to tell you the story of how we got there. Well, first of all, when we enlisted, we uh, got on the Queen Mary. And there, that was a luxury liner, but we were packed in like sardines. The stateroom had many, many bunks. And I know I had the top bunk, and I only had about... 12 inches or I'd bump my head. And well, then we landed in Liverpool and in, they put us out in the country and we lived in uh, those uh, those huts, what, what do they call them? Was it a Quonset? On that idea, um, yeah, yeah, that we lived there because we were waiting to be shipped over to, be, to France. So, there we kind of lived in off of our helmets. Our helmets, we did our washing in and everything else. And so finally, we did get orders to move. So we got on another ship to, to cross the channel. And while we were crossing the channel, uh, German planes went over. They were coming over to bomb England, so we had to evacuate the ship in case we were going to get hit. So we got off the ship and landed in those flat boats and uh, waded in the water like the GIs to the land. And there we waited for transportation. We lived on K rations because there was no hotels or anything. What would have been in the K rations? Canned stuff and dried stuff. It was horrible. <laughs> but I mean, you could live <laughs> with it. So finally, we got the word that transportation was coming. In the Army, you know, it's hurry up and wait. So, okay, the transportation was a freight train. So we rode in boxcars to Paris. There was only hay on the bottom of the boxcar. So we sang, and we just had a wonderful time, and finally got into Paris. Into Paris, we took over a girls' school, and turned it into a hospital. And uh, there were no hotels for us, so what they did is they put a bunch of the nurses into private homes. And we had a French madam who was the house mother. So we would sleep there, but we would have to eat at the hospital and then come back home to, you know, to sleep. Now, did you did you speak French or did you just learn French quickly? I didn't learn it at all. You didn't. <laughs> was was communication difficult at all? Not really. Mm -hmm. For a candy bar, you could get wonderful things. You could get a bottle of champagne, or you could get your laundry done. That that was money. Candy bars. So um, so once you 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 uh, got to England and then you were on your way to, to Paris. What, what was a typical day like for you? What, what did you, what if anything was, was kind of routine about your days while you were serving in Paris? Just a lot of hard work. We did two shifts. You either did days seven to seven or nights seven to seven. And uh, we were t taking care of the wounded. And when the ambulances came, Nobody went home if it was past your shift time. You had to stay and get everybody bathed and into bed. Can Can you describe for us what the hospital looked like? Um, what you What you would hear, see, 
smell? What was what was it like to be in? Well, in that? we were kind of out in the country, and uh, I think it must have been a very nice private school for girls. It was big; it had many floors, and uh, it was brick. It was a lovely place, but it was smack dab into the like into the city, and. Uh, Nothing much was going on around. We just worked, slept. My roommate that was on nights with me would we would go back to, from from duty to sleep for a while. We'd get up about four o'clock, and we'd hop on the metro. And uh, transportation was free to anybody that wore a uniform, and and so you'd go anywhere. So we would we would get on and go to the very end. And then just goof around and explore. Did you have any concerns about about safety as far as just um, you know the fact that there was a war going on? And no, no, no. The Germans were far enough away from us at the time, so we had not no problems. You were not concerned about that. Did did you? Um, how did you? How did you find the the popular French population's um, uh, acceptance of, of you? Being there or, or I don't think they paid any attention to us at all. They didn't bother us at all. Uh, everybody seemed to go about their business and didn't bother with us. Uh, they knew we were there, but I never really had much to do with them. So. And where the the um, the wounded you were taking care of? Where were they coming from for the most part? Um, I think. Of course, you know, the bad wounded go to a mass unit. And either they stopped somewhere else or we were the next place. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're coming from, largely from, um, from where? What, what locations would you say? Oh, gosh, I don't know. All over. Yeah. yeah. Wherever the battle seemed to be going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now you, you trained as a, as a psych nurse. Yes. So, talk talk a little bit about your kind of your duties as a as a psych nurse. Well, I'll tell you the truth. I never had the opportunity to use it. I in in France, I never used it. it while I was in Framingham, it was it was quite an awful thing. We prayed that there would not be a thunderstorm because the boys were back at the front. And me and three core men would go in to try to quiet them down and get things settled down. Because, you know, they really thought they were at the front lines. But uh, other than that, it... So you, was there, we, we talked today in terms of post-traumatic stress. Were, is, is that something that you were seeing in Framingham and... With the boys, yeah. yes. I don't think I had it. Yeah. Do Do you think that it was understood back then? I don't know. I really don't know. The care was not the greatest because in those days uh, they used insulin shock therapy. That's that's a horrible thing. You know, the boys would go into convulsions. But that was the thing they had in those days. Of course, things are different now, so so that was that was not good. But that was supposed to kind of bring the boys out of it. Did so? Did you when you went to um, to Paris? Do you did you feel like you had enough training in more physical injuries? Did you, oh yes. Did you feel adequately trained to to oh, yes. those as well? Oh yes. I gave a lot of penicillin shots. Yeah, and why was that? Because that happened to be the wonder drug. The wonder drug of the year, yeah. And that, I zapped many a GI butt. Yeah, yeah. And got them going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, talk about, if, if you would, just your ability to stay in touch with your family because you were so far away. And, um, and you were so, and that, how old were you at that time? Twenty one. Twenty one. So, so how did you keep in touch with your family? By writing letters whenever we could, and those were kind of far and few between, because we were tired. Mm -hmm. 
you're tired. You do a, a long shift. You're tired, even though we were young. And it was, it was really sad. And uh, it was always nice to get the boys better. And the sad part was they had to go back to the front lines. Very bad, of course, were shipped home. So we didn't see too much of that. Most of our, our boys had to go back to the front lines. How, how long did, if, if there was such a thing as a typical stay in the hospital, how long was that? Well, that depended on where they were shot and how bad the wounds were. Okay. Some could go back in a week. Some, it took a longer period. And then, like I said, if there was a long stretch, they would be sent home. How, how did you and your fellow nurses kind of keep your spirits up and, and keep each other going? Because it was, it was clearly a very difficult, um, it was difficult work for you and, and very stressful and, and exhausting. So how did you keep each other? Well, we used to go to the officers club for fun. And uh, we'd have a few highballs. We they had a band, so you could pick up any guy you wanted to and dance and have a good time. And how often did you find yourself doing that? Well, maybe once a week or so. <laughs> and of course, uh, writing letters home, we always had a big bottle of champagne. You know, when we did stay in to write letters, yeah. and uh, I roomed with three other girls two mostly, and we kind of hung around together. Mm -hmm. So if we were all decided to write letters, well, somebody would get a bottle for a candy bar. So. What was, um, while you were there, um, did, you, did you have a sense that this is my work day, this is my work shift, and now I'm off duty? Or did you find that the nature of the work was such that it, it, you really didn't have much in the way of, of time away. It was, it was kind of all-consuming. No. 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 We, uh, we did our thing, and we did have our fun. So you did your job, and, and you... Then and I have to tell you something, too, that was funny. Uh, I don't know why, but they put out a notice that we were not to go to Momart. Now, we thought, now, why can't we go there? And you know darn well we went. And there was nothing bad there. Well, it was a kind of a hangout for, uh, it was a lot of places for, for drunken soldiers and whatnot, and I guess they didn't want us to get caught in any trouble. But we had to go see what was wrong. Yeah, Tell, what, was, what was Montmartre like? What was it about? And was it, well, it was a typical place where, where there were French restaurants and things. Oh. It wasn't a bad place, okay. and we didn't see any drunks or anything hanging around, and so we went. When they tell you to not to do something, you do it. <laughs> that was the that was the <laughs> motto. We're going. So, well, if you if you had gotten caught, what what would have happened? Well, I think well, we would they wouldn't have sent us home, but you know we would have been reprimanded. We would have been down in the the head nurse's office and got told off. Mm. So, but that never happened. Do you ever think that that experience um, as a young woman back then was in some ways uh, very liberating that you, you were able to, to do whatever you wanted to do, that you had tremendous responsibilities, that whatever... Well... It gave me a lot of confidence in myself because basically I was a very shy person. Really? Yes, I was. I mean, if you said boo, I would turn all shades of red, and particularly if a man said boo at me. So, you know, I was thrown into contact with a lot of guys. And so I got a lot of self-confidence, and I, I could communicate with people, which I couldn't before. I had to ask the boys, where does it hurt? How do you feel? You know, all that sort of stuff. So I think I came out of there uh, a better rounded person. 
How long do you do you recall how long you were there? A year. I two? think about a year and a half. A year and a half. Yeah, because I saw uh, VE Day and VJ Day mm -hmm. also. What was that like? Well, VE Day was quite something. We, I don't know whether I should say this, you can cut it out. We all got drunk along with all the French people, and we were dancing in the street because the war was over. I think I'll leave that in. And... Uh, and then the sad part was that we had to break up the hospital because they were going to ship us to the Pacific. So we did break up the hospital and we got shipped to Marseille, which is a big shipping port. And there we lived in tents. And that was kind of a horrible experience. It seemed like we were out in the desert. We had canvas tents and we slept on cots with a wooden floor and it seemed like there was sand in your bed and sand in your food but anyway while we were there we did something too which we shouldn't have done but you know we had idle time so we'd get up on the roof of one of the buildings and we'd kind of strip you can cut this out we strip and get a suntan <laughs> well the air force heard about it so pretty soon they were flying real low to see these bathing <laughs> beauties on the roof. But anyway, the war ended, so it was time to go home. Um, talk more, if you will, about the, the celebratory experience of VE Day in, in Paris. In, it was just bedlam. This, if, Everybody was to out China. drinking champagne, screeching, yelling, dancing. Everybody was having a ball. Yeah. Hold on one second. I'm, I will cut this out. You know what? Put your um, hand underneath yeah. there. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. 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 I think maybe you should cut out that part about the officers' club, but the enlisted men. Uh, why? I don't know. You think I should I, be? People, I think we did that for the boys. Yes, and and I may ask you to um, let me ask you to talk. Um, you mentioned um, bringing some of the the young men to the officers' club with the bar. What was it that made you decide to do that? We wanted them to have a good time, and we wanted them to be able to go to the front lines and brag that they'd been an officer for a night. Mm -hmm. And we thought that would do a lot for the morale. Yeah. And they were scared skinny, but we, we were all there in combat boots. Who's going to know the difference? Mm -hmm. Nobody knew who you were, what you were, and nobody cared. It sounds like you were you were very uh, sensitive to what they were experiencing. Well, we wanted them to have a good time. But you had a sense of, of what they had been going through on the. On well, the I thought we I thought we were a pretty good good bunch of girls. Yeah. Because it wasn't just my idea. They were everybody was doing it. So. Really? Yeah. yeah. So. so um, did you ever get to see any USO shows? No, they never happened to come by. Okay, so you're so for entertainment, you were pretty much limited to the officers' club. The officers club. But although they did give us an R and R, and we went to the Riviera. What was that like? And that was pretty cool. <laughs> what was that like? Well, we were in a swanky hotel, and I and when I found out I was going. I had to write home in a hurry and please ship me a bathing suit because I wanted to swim there. And we were we were just like visitors and having a great time. We had all their facilities and of course the army took over it, you know, so but that was nice. Was there a sense um, that that uh, as you were kind of going about, whether it was taking some R and R or just relaxing, did you feel like there was a war going on? Yes, 
We knew that what all was, the time. Well, you, you, you knew about it, but were, were you feeling that from the, the local population? Were you reading about it, hearing about it? Well, you, we had a, I can't remember the name of the newspaper, but we always knew what was going on because mm -hmm. uh, the Army put out a newspaper, so we knew exactly what battle was going on. So, I mean, you just didn't forget. And then you had your wounded all the time, so you knew there was a war going and the, on. And the population that you, the, the French population was also, as, as, from, as far as you could tell, very aware of? I would war. presume so. Yeah, well. I would, yeah, because they had their newspapers too, so. So, um, so you talked about gaining confidence and, um, and, and other life experience. What else about your service? do you think was valuable? Well, I give a, a darn good injection because I had plenty of experience. Because when I did come home, I did go into nursing at home in, in, at one of the hospitals at Mount Sinai at that time. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I just felt very sure of myself. I, 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 I wasn't afraid. If I had to do something, I could do it, and or if I couldn't, I would ask. So, I don't know really how to answer that. Um, where now, when your your service ended, where did you go from there? Talk about that that day when you found out you were leaving, and then. Well, I was one of the lucky ones. I got flown into Mitchell Field. And uh, I had a boyfriend that was 4F, so he didn't go into the service at all, but he knew that I was going to have a good time while I was gone, mm -hmm. that I was not going to just write letters home to him. So I contacted him, and he came and picked me up at Mitchell Field and brought me home. And what, was, what were those first few moments back on U.S. soil like? Truthfully, I can't remember. I was just glad to be home and off the plane. And, and you have, um, did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I did. I, I had a, a brother who was a POW in Germany. He was the uh, tail gunner in the Air Force. And then I had another brother who was uh, in the infantry in Italy. So... You know, in the old days, you hung that little thing in the window, and there were three stars. That's what we, you know, you could look at a family front window and tell how many people were in the service. It's just my brother just died uh, about a year ago, the POW guy. Um, and you know, he never wanted to talk about it. Did you, because the three of you had some service experience together, were you, were you able, the three of you able to talk about it among yourselves? My brother, the POW, my brother Ed, no, he didn't want to talk about it at all. And uh, my other brother, he was the oldest one. We'd, we'd talk Army talk occasionally, but not too much. I don't think Army people talk too much about Is there a lot that was just that was unsaid because it didn't mean anything? Right, because I've met other people. Like Art, uh, he and I will sit together and talk and I'm sure there's a lot he's not telling me, and I don't tell him everything either. So, did, were you able to keep in touch with your brothers uh, during service? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh no, 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 no. My brother that was in Germany. No, I had no way to get a hold of him, and then I never did talk to my brother or see him while he was in Italy mm -hmm. until we all got home. Mm -hmm. were, were the uh, was, it, was it just the three of you uh, as the right. children? So you're so. What was, from your uh, understanding, what was that like for your parents to have all three of your children? Well, we I come from a family of 13. And uh, I don't know, as my mother got very much in the way of news, I'm sure letters were scarce because I didn't write that much and I'm sure my brother didn't either. But I'm sure she was pretty well shook up about my brother being a, a prisoner of war. So, uh, but 
she was a pretty strong lady, so she accepted things and hoped for the best. Um, okay, so you're, what did you do um, in the days and weeks that followed your coming back home? Did you go right to work? Did you... No, I didn't do anything. I figured I needed a rest. And, uh, of course, my boyfriend was around, so I dated him. And uh, eventually we did get married. And, uh, well, nothing too exciting. I know we bought a house and it was hard to get stuff because it was the end of the war and, you know, a lot of stuff wasn't available, but. So you're, you, you left the Army as, a, as an RN, and were you looking forward to, to working as an RN stateside? Yes, I was, but my husband wouldn't let me. He figured a woman, he was kind of old-fashioned, he figured a woman's place was in the home to take care of her kids and have cookies when they came home from school. So I did that until Sue, my daughter, was about... 14 years old, and I rebelled, and I said, I'm going back to work. Because I said, a lot of procedures had changed. I want to go back and refresh myself. So against, well, he finally gave in, and he said, well, try it for a couple of months. Well, that went on for years and years, and he'd keep saying, are you still refreshing yourself? And i say, yes, I am. <laughs> So you enjoyed a long and successful career, ultimately. Yes, I worked many, many years. I I must have worked 30, 35 years at Mount Sinai. And uh, I did general duty, and then I became uh, the big honcho in the clinic. And I did all clinics. You name them. I did PD clinic. PD clinic would see 40 babies at a clip. And then I did the surgical clinic. I did dermatology. You name it, I did them all. And then gradually we got bigger and bigger. So we all branched out and we had our pick. So I picked OBGYN. And I have to tell you an interesting story. And you can cut this out. But I had a cat. Uh, oh, I had, I had adopted two kittens. And I named one of them. Benson, and he was named after a gynecologist that I worked with. He, his name was Dr. Benson Horowitz, and he was tickled pink that I named the cat after him. <laughs> so you can cut that out. That's okay. <laughs> Just thought I'd tell you that story. So um, did, did you make um, any, any close friends during your service such that you kept in touch after? I, ke I kept in touch with my two roommates. But then that kind of died out. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's happened to them since, you know, it got to be just Christmas time, Christmas cards, but uh, I don't know if they're dead or not or what, so that's sad. And we never had a big reunion of the 198th General Hospital. Mm -hmm. That was my outfit, the 198th, so. Um, did, did you find that the Army Anything difficult about the adjustment back after your experience, um, just in terms of the pace or the kinds of things that you were dealing with? Or, no. No. Just no. Got, got no. Back into it. Um, how did your military service uh, influence the way you think about war or the military in general? That's a tough one. Well, truthfully, now that I'm older, I don't give it much thought. Sometimes I don't like the way things were happening. My grandson went to uh, one of the wars over there, uh, not Afghanistan, but the one before that. And uh, things weren't very good over there, so I don't know who's to blame. I really, that's, that's a hard thing to answer. I can't, uh, I don't know who's to blame for what when things don't go right, you know? And it's really not my place. I'm just an old lady. Did you, 
Did you join any veteran organizations? No. Nope. Did you did you have any interest in did you did you feel as though if you wanted to you could have you would have been welcome? Yes, I would have, but I just yeah. didn't want to. I I was really busy working and bringing up a family. That was my main goal. Do you do you identify as a veteran? And I, and I ask that only because um, I have heard that there are um, there are a number of, of women who um, don't necessarily identify as veterans. If, if asked if they have been in the service, they will respond yes, but they don't necessarily see themselves as veterans. And no, I'm very proud. I'm a veteran. And you and you rec you see that yourself as a veteran. Yes, I do. Um, what would you, how, how did your service and experiences affect your life? And I know that's a, that's a very, very broad question. Um, but if you were to think about how you might have gone along in your life without having been in the service and having had the experiences and thinking about it in the, in light of those experiences, what do you think is different about the way you lived your life? Well, like I said before, I think I'm a better person for it. I, uh, I, and I think I'm a stronger person because, like I said, I was a very shy person. And uh, I don't know what I would have been doing if I hadn't been. Maybe I'd been doing nothing. I don't know. Is there anything else that you would want um, to share about your experience? You, you before we started um, this interview, you you had a, a number of very funny um, experiences to relay. Um, there was also some some very difficult times as well. But but what other um, what other things do you want to share about your experience? Well, Either can you think times or uh, or something that was especially um, kind of funny or enjoyable or, or particularly difficult? Something that I don't know. Out? Right offhand, did I say something to you that I can you refresh my memory? Well, just in, in, um, it, it sounds like like you and those you were with. Despite what you, despite the difficulty of the work you were doing, you found ways to, and, and in part because you were young, and um, but you talk, but you you found ways to entertain yourselves or or just kind of take breaks from the. I think we were typical kids, you know. You know, uh, we, like I said, we were in for an adventure. That's why we originally joined. Sure, we wanted to be patriotic, but I don't think we were out there to save our country. We were out to go have some fun. That's why we joined. And uh, we knew the war was going on, but like I said, that was... So it, was, it, seemed, it seemed an opportunity for a real adventure. That was the basic thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think all kids are like that, you know. Well, most of the people that you were around, between your fellow nurses and and the, those you were treating, were largely very young. Yes, we were. We were all in the same age bracket. Yeah. I don't think we had any any really old lady in the outfit. Well, maybe our head nurse. Mm -hmm. She might have been older than us yeah. because she was a captain, and uh, so maybe she was maybe five years older. Yeah. But that's still young too. Yeah. So. All right. Um, so, if you were to have any parting words of, of wisdom for future generations on on any any topic, what would you? What would I you tell like them go for it. Go for it. See where it takes you. Okay. You know, rather than sit still and do nothing, go for it. Well, um, I'd like to thank you, Ms. Thompson, for your time today and for 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 sharing with us some of your experiences uh, thank you for your service and um, wish you all the very best thank you